All right, we're ready to get started. We're here. Thanks for tuning in again. Uh, my name is Chris Brendrat with uh, William Chris Vineyards, my beautiful uh, girlfriend and uh, wife, <laughs> Catherine. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in again to, uh, uh, for the second tasting of the, uh, of the four pack. Um, we're going to keep on bringing you these every week uh, with new wines mm -hmm. and uh, kind of uh, some, some new experiences. Uh, today we made a little, um, it's kind of hard to see this, but um, we ate a lot of cheese yesterday, so we, um, <laughs> we have, it up. have a little tomato, uh, fresh tomato here. We, also, we've been, you know, cooped up, and I feel like we've been eating a lot of, like, bad food um, and snacking, like, way more. Yep. Um, yep. And so this is something that my kids like, that, that I love. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. We um, used a little verju, which... Um, I don't know if you guys get that closer. Verjou is, um, there's no alcohol in this, it's actually picked, uh, it's all Tanat grapes, um, and it was actually picked when the grapes were about uh, 10 bricks, or very little little bitty green berries, and then we press it and just let it settle. There's no fermentation that happens in this, uh, it's very acidic, um, but you can use it as a replacement for uh, vinegar, or you can use it as a replacement for, for lemon juice. I like it in a salad. Um, with a little olive oil, uh, salt, pepper, um, and verjou, um, and garlic, uh, works, works really beautifully. Um, a dear friend, Kelly Cunningham, she, uh, she uses a little honey and uh, Dijon mustard in there too, which is, which is awesome for a salad dressing. But, um, cool thing, every person that orders a four pack for next week is in the next 24 hours is going to get one of these, um, gratis in your shipment. So, um, enjoy, you, enjoy that. You said these, the grapes that we used for this were picked at 10 bricks. Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain what, what you mean by bricks? Sure, sure. And what Brick. is that, how does that differ from a normal um, that's a, grape that we would use for winemaking? That's a great question. Um, you know, bricks is a unit of measurement called, uh, uh, of sugar. Um, so B-R-I-X is the unit. Mm -hmm. And um, we typically pick the Tanat uh, fruit out, out right outside at say 25 or even 26 bricks. For um, for when we're intending to, to make, make wine, wine. Yeah, okay. absolutely so much lower. Right, right. Um, so this is very high acid, and again, there's no alcohol in this at all. Um, it's just a fun thing that it's a very old thing. It's been around for for thousands of years. Um, it's been a fun thing. So mm -hmm. uh, we really uh, Tony and I had a lot of fun making this, and we've got another vintage of it too. So, well, let's get started. Um, let's make sure we have all of our supplies. Um, girlfriend. Chuck. <laughs> Glasses, check. I like to use two glasses. Um, you know, uh, you could use a single glass, no problem. Um, but let's jump in. We're going to start off today with with our Mary Ruth uh, 2019. Um, Mary Ruth Blackman uh, is what this name wine was named after. Um, my mother gives me a rash of hell because I haven't ever named a wine after her. Maybe one day, Mom. I promise it. I'm also not wearing a. Gangster hat, I yes. think, is what she referred she, to that yesterday. Yeah, she did not like the hat you were wearing yesterday. <laughs> it, is, it was from a natural wine festival in Austin called Wild World. Yeah. So it was two W's. Um, I don't know. I guess I thought it was a wrestling thing. My mom thought it was a gang sign. Well, she hat. thought it was a gang thing, but your dad <laughs> thought it was a wrestling, <laughs> wrestling anyway, thing. We're in a good old William, William Chris cap today. Uh, so Mary Ruth is um, Mary Ruth Blackman is what this name, wine is named after. Uh, Mary Ruth Blackman was Bill or William's uh, mother, uh, and also Carol. If you if you know Miss Carol, she runs all of our uh, grounds here and landscaping and flowers. What big reason why the the water property looks so beautiful? Um, but that was her her mother, and um, she greatly supported Bill um, on his first vineyard planting in 1984, which is pretty awesome. She also supported uh, Bill and I opening up this winery. Um, she really backed us um, uh, and, and used her, her trust to, to uh, back us uh, at the very beginning buying this property, uh, which is awesome. I see some of you guys out there. I uh, want to give a shout out to Gabe. Uh, thanks so much uh, for tuning in. Terry, that's awesome. Dave Wisey, Dave. good to hear from you, sir. Our old neighbor. Uh, thanks for checking in today. Um, so oh, this, yeah, where's everyone watching from? Yeah, absolutely. We'd love like to see where you are. Yeah. The, where are you hunkered down? <laughs> that's right. Where are you quarantining? <laughs> um, so Mary Ruth comes from uh, three of my absolute favorite vineyards. Uh, uh, the Malvasia is from our great friends down uh, in Meadow, uh, or up in Meadow. Um, the Fergusons and Seton family, really great guys. They also grow a lot of Morbet for us. 
as well. Um, these guys are just really pushing the envelope every year. Um, so, so shout out to Farmhouse. Um, also, the Blanc du Bois comes from actually two vineyards that uh, we just started working with this year. Um, the uh, the uh, Whistling Duck Vineyard um, and the uh, Rummage Vineyard. Um, those guys are in East Texas doing a good job. We've, we've contracted with them again to, to buy their Blanc du Bois. And uh, a little bit of Moscato Giallo from uh, Gil, or Bill and Gail Day, uh, really nice folks in Meadow, Texas. Um, so in this blend, again, this is the first white wine that we ever produced. I think I want to say it was either 09 or 2010. Um, and I think it was 100% orange muscat back then. And over the years, we've we've just kind of dialed in. Um, I, I wish we could grow great Sauvignon Blanc here. I just haven't tasted that much. It's just, it's just a tough grape to grow here. But I love the grassiness of this wine, um, but also the citrusy and the fruit forwardness of this wine. Um, and I think we really find this kind of harmony between Blanc de Bois, uh, which kind of gives you that grassy note, and then the Malvasia, um, and then the Moscato Giallo. You know, it's not too perfumey. Mm -hmm. I think Moscato Giallo by itself can be sometimes one-dimensional. And I think when when you blend all three of those varieties together, you really get something fantastic. And, um, you know, I think the past three years uh, has been a very similar blend of Mal Malvasia, uh, Blanc du Bois, and mm -hmm. Moscato Giallo. Um, they varied just a little bit on the percentage, but those are the varieties that I think we'll use for um, you know the next the next thirty years here at William Chris with with Mary Ruth. So, mm -hmm. cheers, guys. Mm. I love this wine. Um, again, it, it, it's not Sauvignon Blanc, but it has that grassy note, which I really appreciate. Um, the Malvasia gives it lift. There's it's great acid. Um, hats off to to Tony. He really he really knocked it out of the park this year. Um, Let's keep on cruising. Also, guys, this is somebody's first wine tasting of any kind. Welcome. That's awesome. Yes. Well, hopefully you can come and enjoy one in the tasting room soon. Get mm -hmm. that full effect. But uh, glad you're joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for, for tuning in. Who was that, by the way? Dan. 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 Awesome. Thanks for thanks for tuning in, Dan. Um, next up, we're going to go to the 2017 Enchante. Mm -hmm. um, I had to go on a bike ride this morning because we did a pretty deep vertical last night of Enchante. I think we opened up uh, a 10, an 11, a 12, 12 and a 14. 14. Yeah. And oh. then we had the 17, which is the one we're tasting today. Yes. And I tell you what, if you have any of those wines in your cellar, um, we were having a deep conversation about really the 10, 11, and 12 were, were just absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. The 14 was still, it still had a lot of life on it too. It could, it could go for another four or five years. But um, Enchante um, is the first red blend uh, that we ever produced. Um, and it was originally 100% from Granite Hill Vineyards, mm -hmm. uh, which is, which is um, Bill planted that uh, in 1996, I believe, um, right north of Fredericksburg in, in what we call the Hickory Sands. Um, so, to put it in perspective, where I'm, I'm coming, or we're talking to you from uh, the highest state right now, um, which is in smack dab in the middle of the Bridnaus River Valley. Um, and so, the uh, the geology here is really interesting in that um, it's all it's all river bottom, um, kind of sandy loam over limestone. But if you get out to right north of Fredericksburg, there's one of the coolest geological formations. Um, there's not only the Llano Uplift, which helped um, produce the the hickory sands. So you have, um, you know, I think billions of years of, of decomposed granite over sandstone um, because there was an underground pool of lava. I don't know if it was a pool, but it, it pushed up um, and it never got to the surface. But over the years, the uh, the dirt was worn away, and then you have like what's Granite Hill and all those granite domes out there. Um, so this wine now is mostly from Granite Hill, but also um, from some of our other partners. Um, in, in Mason, um, well, we've got Dan McLaughlin out of uh, Robert Clay, um, and then also uh, Drew Talent from Talent Vineyards. Uh, so we're taking this wine over the past couple of years to more of a Hickory Sands Bordeaux blend and, and less of just a single vineyard wine. Um, Granite Hill, which is a fantastic, amazing vineyard, um, you know, it's, it's kind of seen its day where we've, we've ripped some vines out we're replanting some vines. We actually have some Tanat plantings up there, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, so let's. Yeah. Hi to in. Alan from Toronto. Hey. Well. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> I really appreciate it. That's mm -hmm. so cool. I wish we shipped wine to Canada, but I think it's really difficult. Right? Yeah. 
we ship light all over the place. Yeah. Soon, maybe. Mm -hmm. Especially if this isolation continues. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, oh, also, I'll note that this wine, um, all the enchantes that we were eating, or drinking yesterday, Catherine and I aren't um, huge red meat people, but man, we, we did it up last night. We okay. had Wagyu hamburgers um, and a little Wagyu uh, sirloin, which was Gosh. out of sight and um, really uh, it just complemented uh, this wine so well. Um, mm -hmm. All of the enchantes that we tasted. Um, I definitely think that um, maybe a little less fattier meat than Wagyu would, would be absolutely singing for this, but last night it, it really hit the spot, I think. So. It was. Um, Very good. Um, I also think that the Hickory Sands always has that kind of um, like Bing cherry and, and cola uh, aromatic that I just really, I can pick out the Hickory, Hickory Sands in almost any wine. Um, and again, these this is what north and west of Fredericksburg tastes like, which mm -hmm. I think is really, really fantastic. So, enchanté, yo. Oof. We have a question coming in though. Oh, shoot, great. Shoot. Yeah. Um, so I learned the difference between fruit forward notes and sweet notes. I still use that knowledge with friends today, but maybe you could give us more of an explanation between the two. Sure. Uh, That's fruit a forward great and sweet. question. Fruit forward versus sweet. Absolutely. How can you tell the difference? Well, so I would what say like the Mary Ruth has a lot of uh, fruit forward notes mm -hmm. um, and the acidity is very... Um, um, it's, it's got very good acidity, so I would call that very fruit forward. Uh, it's very aromatic, um, but it's definitely not sweet. By, by uh, definition, what makes a sweet wine? Well, so a sweet wine is wine that has any residual sugar. I think the, the technical is over uh, 0.08 or 0.1 um, uh, residual sugar. Okay, so for non-wine makers, does that mean... I, I know the answer. Don't look at me. <laughs> but does that mean you're adding sugar to a sweet wine? Uh, in most cases, no, yeah. but some, some, yes. And I mean, we don't add um, sugar to our wines here. I mean, this, we don't really have sweet wine. Right, right, right. Um, however, uh, a lot of sweet wines do have that residual sugar mm -hmm. added. Some of them uh, mm -hmm. in, in the United States uh, have that sugar added to them. So if um, it's not added, where did it come from? That's what I'm getting at in the winemaking process. Oh, uh, from residual, from uh, mm -hmm. fermentation being arrested, like a lot of Rieslings um, out of Europe have. Uh, residual sugar that when they, they actually arrest the fermentation, um, which is pretty cool. So fermentation turns that sugar in the fruit to alcohol. To alcohol. Correct. So if you don't full finish that process, there's still mm -hmm. some sugar remaining. But I think I think what this person um, is, is referring to though is sweet notes, like a lot of, a lot of uh, sweet notes come out of uh, wood. So I would definitely say some of the older enchantes had last night had that, that kind of sweet cola um, that, that also comes from the terroir, but also the barrels we use too. So a little bit of that caramel, a little bit of that uh, honey or cinnamon, those are all considered sweet notes, uh, in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, and that, that really um, enhance the fruit, uh, to say the least. But it's not sugary on your tongue. Um, but what happens in a barrel is when, when they, they form a barrel, make the barrel, uh, they take wood that has a lot of like vanillin and lignin, a lot of wood sugar, and they toast the inside. So what happens when you take sugar and you throw it on a hot pan? It caramelizes, right? Um, and the same thing happens in a barrel, uh, which whenever we put wine in a barrel, it seeps into those couple of millimeters of wood, which is really cool, and uh, adopts some of those flavors, like uh, you know all, all the baking spices, cardamom, um, vanilla, um, all those spices and, and aromatics um, meld with the fruit to kind of uh, give, give you those some of those sweet notes. So I hope that answers Hopefully. your question. Hopefully. <laughs> Somebody asked a good question. Um, well, I don't know which one you're thinking, Kelsey. Yeah. But uh, what do you consider the grape that defines Texas now? And what grape will it be in the future? Well, it's more Vedra, clearly, of course, uh, of course it's most of our production. Um, I, I, would, <laughs> I would say, I, and, and uh, for, for those of, of, of our fans and, and uh, other fellow winemakers that know me, I'm, I'm very partial to Morved. I love where it grows in the hill country and the high plains. Um, I think Merlot is an, an incredible variety, too. I mean, Merlot and Enchante, uh, I mean, you talk about vines that can stand the test of time, um, you know. Like we want to grow things that are successful in the state and that grow well, um, because Morvedro, we've never, knock on wood, we've never missed a crop of it. I'd probably say that yeah, to get to, but um, <laughs> such a hardy variety for Texas. I think Tanat is uh, really fantastic, especially, excuse me, in the hill country. 
Um, we're seeing also, and uh, I tell you what, Tony and I tasted the the uh, uh, 18 uh, Timmins to not uh, from Lubbock County. And oh my gosh, it is so, so gorgeous and, and so beautiful. So I think those are some big ones. San Giovese, and I think is another killer variety for the state of Texas. Um, you know, we have a, a, a multitude of, of growers doing mm -hmm. an incredible uh, San Giovese. Um, but I think you'll see that for the next 30 years, 40 years. Um, and I really think that um, you'll see some of these other varieties just be less significant as we start farming um, longer. Um, you know, we just had a really tough winter, so we'll we'll see what what kind of shakes out. And you know, I think a lot of people are making some different decisions now. And like, hey, we're not going to grow this if, even if a winery wants it. We don't want to farm it because it's it's less successful. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Tanat. Someone else asked if we would explore Tanat, and I don't know if she was wondering if we were thinking about growing it or making it, which we do already. Um, yes. But if you're wondering if we could do a tasting with it. Oh, we'll see why yeah, not. Absolutely. In the we'll future, definitely. we can um, dive deeper into a tonight. We just revisited this 16 high state tonight the other day, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. We have, I think we have three different single vineyard tonights right now, uh, or maybe four. So, well, let's keep on, uh, let's keep on cruising, guys. Um, next wine is going to be the Skeleton Key Proprietor's Red. Um, just FYI, we do have now we have a, a Skeleton Key Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, we also have a. Um, skeleton Key Proprietor's White, uh, White Blend, and this is the, the Skeleton Key Red Blend. Um, I will give you a little pro tip if you want to know kind of which vintage we're on. Most of these are actually vintage, but we don't, we don't, um, we rarely put a vintage on there. There's a little um, Roman numeral right above the, the barcode. If you guys can see that. Uh, it's pretty dark. Yeah, I don't know. If you Anyways, there's a little. Your own, there is your one own there. bottle. <laughs> uh, just, a, just a little one. Yeah. Just a little. Um, We're drinking the five. Yeah, this is the B. Um, so uh, this also has quite a bit of uh, Cabernet um, Sangiovese in it, and the, the varieties kind of vary from year to year. Um, so I think we started this in 2013, or with the 13 vintage. Um, basically, it was a really tough vintage for Texas. Um, we had a lot of uh, freezing in uh, lay freezes in, in the high plains. So I literally like got in my pickup and drove all over East Texas. Um, we found all these little nook and cranny vineyards and uh, brought in all these different um, varieties, all these different um, fruit. Um, Keeper Sol was a big, big help in that year. Um, and we ended up blending and, and making all these really great wines. And then we had a couple of barrels, I think maybe 20 barrels or so left over. And then we, we put together this big blend and we're like, okay, what are we going to call it? And we didn't have grand designs to, to actually be available in grocery stores or anything like that then, um, but we thought if we... <laughs> Back then, we didn't think we'd ever be in grocery stores. Yeah, right, Definitely. right. Not, we, not just this wine. We were worried about surviving the next year. Right. <laughs> um, Start <and>, small. <laughs> and so we uh, we came up with this red blend, and, and, and uh, we thought, man, um, and, and the story goes, when, I was, uh, when Bill and I were demoing the old farmhouse, um, we were taking down walls, taking out ceilings, all that good stuff. And we found this little skeleton key and it opened up every single door um, in, in that old farmhouse. And um, that farmhouse, I think great wine, great people in that house were really keys to our success uh, and helping us grow. Um, for those of you who were early, uh, early heroes of William Chris, I think you saw us grow out of that house rather quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we still hold tastings in there, it's still open. Um, but uh, what well, was really it's not open right now. <laughs> it's not open. Right. <laughs> it was open uh, a week ago. But what was really fun is uh, that skeleton key. You know, when we, we named it that, I thought, man, I wish I had that key because I set it on my desk. Um, and of course, I you know told Bill is like you know I, I lost it years ago, and he goes, oh, you didn't lose it. I knew that you would lose it, so I took it off your desk and I've had it in my desk. So um, this is actually a key, a picture of the original skeleton key, which is, is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and it knows you so well. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so again, the varieties change slightly every year. The blend changes every year. And I will say for, for Tony and I and our winemaking team, this is absolutely one of the hardest wines um, to blend um, because it's we want to blend it for consistency every year. Um, and of course, we have different, different wines available every year. Um, and so we're combing through our barrels trying to blend for a profile right uh, i will say like sangiovese is almost always a big part of this cab merlot is almost always a big part of this sometimes some vintages have had syrah in it mm -hmm. um, tempranillo 
um, you know, and, and those will fluctuate. But um, from a blending standpoint, um, I think we're all really well known for our single vineyard wines. And I think, you know, when when, when Tony and I are putting those wines together, they're, they, they really sing, they're beautiful, and you're accentuating what a little area of Texas tastes like. Well, this is a blend of wines or grapes from all over the state of Texas. Um, so we're really blending for a profile, which is... Uh, it's a lot of fun, but it's it's pretty nerve wracking. It takes us a couple of months to, to to put it together. And I think uh, the boys after the twentieth time back to the cellar to go get you know one barrel sample are finally like, "Are you guys there yet?" <laughs> but, um, so, cheers to Skeleton Key. Also, um, it should be noted that you can get this wine H E B Central Market Whole Foods. We love it when you order it from us directly. Um, but you can find this wine all over. Um, well, fine dining restaurants when they're open. <laughs> um, but, you know, I just thought it might be fun. Mm -hmm. So we've got four wines that we're tasting through for you. Um, but since we're all at home on our own, you probably don't have all four open for your own. Mm -hmm. um, so tasting Skeleton Key right now, give us a like or like a, a thumbs up if you're drinking the Skeleton Key right now. If that's the one you chose to open yeah. while you watch. So just to give, a, give, us, give us an idea who's... Who's drinking who's, what? Who's, who's sipping on the key? Mm -hmm. um, also, guys, we, we did the, this very tasting yesterday as well. I think next week we're going to change up the format a little bit and do um, only these virtual tastings maybe only just once or maybe twice a week. Um, we're, we're kind of working on that schedule. Um, but again, if you guys have formatting, um, formatting suggestions, mom, if you're watching, if you don't like my hat, you just let me know. You can text me, call me, no problem. Uh, thanks for She'll all the feedback. You know. Well, let's um, let's keep on going. And Kelsey, okay. if we have any questions, you just yeah, anything. You holler at me. Yeah, I was kind of watching along, but I got distracted, and I wanted to listen to you instead. So I stopped you watching. Thank you. I guess I should thank be you, thank you. pouring this. Right, outwards. pour with the proper. Usually proper facing turn. you. Um, so this wine is our famous hunter. Um, <laughs> Most of this wine hails from the Hunter family vineyard. Um, Bill planted this vineyard, I think, in 1991 um, uh, with with Eunice Hunter, and she. Uh, we didn't mention this yesterday, but no, she just didn't. passed away a few weeks ago. Um, shout out to the Hunter family. She's an amazing woman. Uh, Mark and his sisters uh, still in the vineyard. They lease it to us, um, and we have a, a long term long term agreement with them, which is fantastic. They've been big supporters of the winery. They're actually um, part. Uh, they own a small percentage of William Chris as well. They've been um, longtime supporters, so cheers to them. Um, we also have a little bit of Merlot in here from Paca Vineyards. Um, and I, actually, I didn't realize until I looked at the tech sheet earlier, there's a little dash of Merlot in here from Boland Vineyards as well. Oh, yeah, um, I forgot about that. Yeah, shout out to those guys. They just opened up a tasting room. I haven't been. They did? Yep. Um, Is it just their same name, Boland? Boland Vineyards. Great. Uh, yeah, that's in, um, oh gosh, the name of the that gum town is escaping me. It's in the hill country? No, in the high plains. Oh, um, yeah. I know that somebody will see this and then correct me and tell me where Boland Vineyards uh, or well, Boland Winery is. That um, can be our trivia for today. <laughs> yeah. <but laughs> where is Boland Vineyards? I'll think about it in a second. Um, so th this <laughs> I is, don't know. You should know. This is definitely a, a quintessential high plains wine. Um, you know, it's uh, predominantly Merlot, about 75, or this this particular vintage is 74% yeah. Merlot, 26% Malbec. Um, and we've mm. kind of dug our heels in on the Merlot Malbec uh, blend. Um, super tannic, super earthy. Um, I, I love the spice of, of Merlot and then that kind of the sweet notes that the Malbec really, uh, it, it, it def definitely adds that fruit component, um, mm -hmm. which I love. And I think Malbec is, is kind of a, uh, I wouldn't say it, it is, well, I will say it's a little dicey. You know, we've got to make sure um, that we really farm this these, these Malbec grapes uh, perfectly because they don't take any type of moisture, especially when they're very ripe. Um, so shout out to uh, Dusty Gillum at uh, Gillum Gap and also the guys at Lost Straw. They do a fantastic job uh, farming our, mal our Malbec. Um, you know, we, we kind of really reduce the crop load uh, and make sure that it ripens um, uh, at a really good rate. Um, so we're not hanging Malbec late season. Also the Merlot off the Hunter uh, and, and uh, you know, we, the Merlot is kind of technically under our control, but really the Lost Straw team, you know, they, they farm this vineyard, they do all the day-to-day -day work, they do a great job. Um, and, and the old vineyard, is, it's, it's great because it just kind of produces that same 
3.5 to 4.0 tons per acre mm -hmm. every year and just grows incredible fruit. And um, those guys have really, really done a, a good job. We used to long distance farm that and they've come in and really helped out. Um, but this hunter, I think this vintage, I think is one of the, the best we've ever produced. It's beautiful. Um, to say the least. Your, um, mom, your mom is watching and she says, you look good. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, thank Sue. You. <laughs> I sent her a, a, a not so nice uh, uh, Giffy this morning <laughs> from her comments. So thanks, mom. Um, we really do want the feedback. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, but th this this is this smells like the high plains. It tastes like the high mm -hmm. plains. Um, you know, this is all uh, grown off of uh, old seabed, uh, ancient seabed, um, uh, which limestone. So violets are one of the first things that I smell in this wine, and that that would you generally tell me that the wine uh, the grapes are grown over limestone. Um, but again, love love this wine. Um, and I think we have now eight vintages uh, of yeah, yeah, yes, seven, right. seven or eight vintages of Hunter. So. And all with the red foil. It's the only one we use mm -hmm, red on. Mm -hmm. Fire engine red. Um, Easy to identify. Before I forget, too, guys, we've got a, um, a couple more things before we, we sign off here. Um, if you are really missing William Chris or you're, you're wanting to put together the ultimate dinner for your family, um, check out our playlist on um, Spotify. You can search for William Chris Vineyards. Uh, all of those songs, um, we've actually gone through and tasted wines listening to those songs and they've all been like hand selected um, to blend really well with our wine and make our, our your wine experience even better. So you can check it out on Spotify. Um, also, Good thing to mention. Go ahead. Well, I wanted to thank everyone who's ordered, and also those who have come by and picked up curbside. Uh, we're doing that every day, twelve to five. Um, don't have to get out of your car at all. We'll bring the order to you. Um, if if you can come out and pick up, what you do when you get here is you text the phone number three one three three one three, and your message to that phone number is pick up. Um, we'll verify you're over 21 and then get your name or order number, whichever you provide, and we'll bring your wine order right out to you and Absolutely. go home and enjoy it in um, your isolation. We're also doing a few of these wines for next week's pack, so we want to keep the wines fresh. You guys can order your weekly allotment. Um, here's uh, the the uh, High Plains uh, Rosé. This is Morvet and Carignan. Which is making, delicious. It is. We've been... That's... that's uh, Quarantine mommy juice, I think. <laughs> um, we've got some uh, 2017 Las Strauss and So, which is divine. Mm -hmm. Drinking really nice right now. Uh, the 2017 Montepulciano from um, Mandola Vineyards. Which is uh, my current favorite. It is really delicious. delicious. And then the 2015 High Estate Petit Frito. Um, again, we're throwing out some, you could use the coupon code um, High Life, H Y E L I F E. Uh, this evening, we went ahead and extended this for one more day. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to need to get these orders in today or tomorrow. We want to make sure that that you uh, snag these before uh, Wednesday or Thursday. Um, we'll sh we'll be shipping all week. Um, our, our folks at Wine Cup are doing a great job, um, but they're overrun right now, and we're we, we were we're donating some of our tasting room folks to actually work work with wine cup right now because they're they're in the weeds but I, they're mm -hmm. keeping up with uh, they haven't missed a day yet they're incredible I, mean, I tell you what yeah. um, but it's important that if you want to get these wines check out uh, check them out online you can get this four pack for next week's virtual tasting on Saturday we'll do the virtual tasting of these wines Saturday next Saturday at four mm -hmm. um, so you want them on hand and again beforehand. high life is the coupon code to get you a uh, a, a nice little discount, um, and then we're going to be throwing in for everybody today um, a little bottle of Verjou, um that you guys can can cook at home. Uh, and guys, uh, after this after this is over, we're about to go walk the vineyard. Um, I was having a super tough day last week. You know, of course, all the stress of, of all this stuff going on, uh, the uncertainty, um, and I felt like you know the world is on 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 our shoulders right now, and, and I know that I'm not alone in that. Uh, and the kids and I and Catherine and um, a couple of our team, we just walked the vineyards for like 30, 40 minutes. And it felt like this huge um, stress was just gone. And, um, you know, I've been really trying to spend some time outdoors in these tough times. And I would encourage you guys to do the same, even if you're just sitting out in your backyard or going on a walk. Um, you know, of course, practice social distancing. But 
um, go on a run, go on a bike ride, go on a walk. And um, I can't tell you how just relieving it is. Um, you know, we've all lived through our worst day, right? But they've already happened. And, and so there's, there's, um, there's a lot of, of opportunity now to kind of reflect and um, spend more time with your family um, and, and your kids. And mm -hmm. not only enjoy William Chris Wine, which we very much appreciate, um, but also just take, take time for yourself and, and spend some time outside and do some things you haven't done in a long time. And uh, yeah. I think that we can all benefit from that in a big way. Good. Yeah. All right. Do we have any pressing questions, any burning thoughts? Awesome. Well, we'll, we'll get back to you on all these uh, questions and, and answer them uh, next week. We're, we're going to do a little uh, something different next week, too. So I, uh, I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, we haven't thought it up yet. But, I don't know what you're referring to. <laughs> we, well, we did that Friday thing, which was, which was really oh, yeah, cool. Friday. So I think, we'll, I think we'll kind of bring well, that back. Well, and D, our oh, yeah. um, director of education and level, what level is he? Four? Is he working on six thousand? I think yeah. no, he's working on his level four. <laughs> he's working on his level four um, SOM certification. But anyway, he's doing a daily happy hour from his home in Austin at five every day, Monday mm -hmm. through Friday. So tune into him. We'll be putting it on William Chris live feed, just like this is. Also, guys, if you have questions about what what to uh, what to pair with dinner, if you have questions about wines. We are. We have so many great folks um, available on the phone, and we have 17 WSET certified uh, folks on our team. So if you have any questions about old vintages, um, that's something that we're working on too. Is kind of doing an old vintage chart um, uh, as well, so you guys will be able to see like how everything's drinking of, of all your library wines. Again, if you haven't, if you have any 2010, 2011, 2012 Enchante. Man, now is the time to bring them because they are so gorgeous. So um, thanks so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks for your patience, too. I know we're, we're all kind of getting used to this new format that we're uh, – hopefully it's it's not uh, long long lived. But, uh, you know, I love your neighbor. Uh, hug your wife and drink some Texas-grown William Chris wine. Cheers. Bye.